Hi, Steve. Hi, hi Shanaz, how are you? How's my sound? Sound is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, really, really clear. Good, 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 good. Great. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't pick up the microphone. No, it's got... really yeah. loud and clear today. Good. Yeah. Huh. How are you? How's your... <clears throat> How's your weekend been? Oh, gosh. Um... Yeah, I'm okay. It's all of, everything feels fragile mm. and last minute, but mm. it's kind of okay. Mm. Mm. I've spent the last 10 days trying to draw down some money, the final bit of our project money. Mm. It's so complicated because I'm going to get the Permaculture Association to invoice the trust, and then the trust have to send the money to the Permaculture Association, and then they send it to me. And they're all people who work part time and stuff like that. And so it's just, uh, it's taking. Yeah. Away. Yeah. Have you managed to do it? It's, it's, I had confirmation this morning that they'll be making the payment either today, it will be authorized either today or tomorrow morning. And then I don't know what authorized means. Does that mean it's going to appear in my account minutes later? Or does it mean that a, a pigeon will carry a scroll in its thing to, I don't you know, its beak? Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there. And and I've been waiting for ages to be paid by Travel Luck Farm, and they haven't. They've <laughs> not done that either. Mm, it's cause, again mm. part time people working with part time people. Then it's just I mean, it's a nightmare. Mm. So there's little frustrations, and 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 we have John staying. Mm. Great, and it could be two or three months, which will give a bit of stability. But the insurance company who's paying for him. Is they don't reply to our messages. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, so I'm waiting on things in all directions and nothing's happening. So, Are they meant to be a month in advance? I, I, they haven't really answered my questions. They approved the amount that, that was mm. within their budget and that's all we've heard. So I'd really like to invoice for the whole three months right now. It would be great, but... Yeah, that would be good. But anyway, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, right. But other than all that, those are just frustrations. I think it's okay. I haven't been to see the parents in, um, for for two weeks now. Oh. Mm. Two weeks, yeah, probably. Yeah, it's, I didn't go last week, but three. Mm. Um, but that's that. Mm. <laughs> Hmm. That's, yeah, no change, basically, no change. Hmm. I don't know if we're externally... It's just juggling all the balls as usual. All the yeah, balls. Yeah, right. it, it, it is. And then and, and really seriously trying to think about what the objective is for this. What's the continuity for this? course and for sector 39 and you know the collaboration that's forming here and i think i want to really start talking about that in this session is and i think that's our design project is to work out how do we carry how do we you know how do we support each other going forward hmm. well i like i say you know it's uh I think that you're, you know, you're Africa. I, I'm the only English contingent, aren't I? I mean, there's nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> there was meant to be Kim, but she's kind of dropped out. So, um, yeah, no, and it, it, it's made it a little bit random because of people, you know, dropping in and out and then not quite having the capacity to attend all the lectures. And I really haven't been able to give out any donations to people this week because there isn't any money in the bank account. 
you know, just for, as a couple of people, not loads, but there's always one or two that I help them with their data costs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, Gerald and I thought we'd do it. We'd, we felt like we were learning a lot, and I think we have learned quite a lot. Mm. And, of course, there's the, yeah, there's the another 40 people in Kenya doing it at the same time. Yeah. Um, well, I, I did meet, um, you know, one of the benefactors, Barbara, who donated 250 for uh, the last, this course. And yes. I, I did say to her that when she was ready again, that you were willing to receive funds. So, you know, I do try. Well, thank you. Yes, yeah. thank you. That's, that's yeah. great. And, and actually, those funds have been really essential in Kenya. So those guys are struggling. Um, I know. And I mean, it's all it's all just tricky at the moment, you know. Yeah. And, and so, so the, the fact that they provide a lunch is really central to the whole experience, you know, and uh, paying, I don't know, again, just those micro costs that people can't quite afford, you know, to get there every week. Mm. Um, and that's the reality is we need to, you know, people need that kind of support just to remove the limitations, you know, the friction that's stopping them from attending. Yeah. If it's a lunch and a, and a motorcycle taxi fee and, you know, a boda boda um, or, or whatever it is, that makes all the difference. So <clears throat> where I think I'm going with this is I've been looking at as a funding application I think that we should apply for as a group and um, uh, and maybe create some kind of collaboration and I don't want to have two fixed ideas because I'd like to talk it through with everyone especially Carolyn um, who I can see is there so but without getting too far ahead of ourselves that is Let's ask ourselves the question, how do we try and maintain and cultivate this relationship in the spirit of mutual support and of bringing permaculture into to new places, which is the, 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 the mission statement of Sector 39. So we, want to, we don't want to stay in our silo and we recognise that permaculture needs to grow kind of exponentially, really fast. And, and I think that what, we're, what I'm trying to hold in mind is to create something that could be the mechanism that could help facilitate that to happen. A, a very rapid expansion, but also to, because that's what's needed, and also is to somehow capture that experience so that something so there's there's a there's a, 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 a database of some kind that maybe has a kind of social network front end on it, so that all of our learners can log their experience just about permaculture and just about that, and that kind of validates their their learning. There there's that becomes their CV, and. They can interact with our lessons and modules and then respond to that by posting things. They'd have a profile and an ID number and stuff like that. And we could, it could, you know, it's an app. It's something very simple that people could, you know, because if you've already got a phone and you can take uh, photos and you can record some audio, you can type in some words. There you go. That's, that's it. That, that's your, your, your portal to connect to the outside world. And we want people to start permaculture projects to begin to apply it to themselves, to their homes, to, you know, and, and, and reaching out the garden, the community and, and stuff. And if they want to be a learner with us and they want to gain certificates and, and, and you know, some kind of evidence based thing, then we want to see it. We will help you build a portfolio. Tell us your story. Caroline, for example, is doing some teaching and support and coordination in different places. Well, she could in, in, in different settlements or maybe in her own community. Each one of those becomes a little design story that you can talk about and log. And the same for you, Shanaz, is it's only the question of how am I translating this information and, and feeding it into my own life. So, you know. Well, I, I did something today already. I've cleared the place for my compost bins and I've looked at compost bins and 
So, you know, that's one thing I can do. I can't do water butt because I actually physically don't have a downpipe on this property. Believe yeah, me. well, that's, but, and, and maybe but, that's not your priority. So what it is, is you're going to, you with your terms of design is, you're going to think about things that are going to catch and store energy in a form that you, you can utilize it and it's useful to you. And, 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 and looking at the energy flows around your house and you've, you've really optimized that space already, your lovely courtyard and, you know, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so it's about getting those key elements in the right place. So composter, well, that adds to the whole system, feeds the whole system. All of these things start small anyway. And then, and I think that within the model is we also all become if not teachers, we become enablers, we become, you know, a, a conduit to pass on those ideas and allow people to accept them. And Yeah, well, I've told a lot of people that for their uh, optimum um, composting, they need the 30 to 1 ratio. So 30 yes. to 1 nitrogen. In fact, I went to visit a friend's garden yesterday and she had two composters, which she's had going for like 15 years. And it's beautiful in there. And I said, how do you get your thing? You know, it's, it smells like compost. It's delicious. Yes. And I said, she said, well, I said, do you use a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, cardboard? And she says, no, actually, I put in a lot of paper, little paper. Right, yeah. And it does the same thing for, it's carbon, isn't it, paper? That's right, that's right. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it's getting the CN thing right. And without even knowing the numbers, if it's sticky and smelly and wet, yeah. you haven't got enough carbon and you, if you have too much, carbon it just looks like a pile of carbon it doesn't break down much so so it's it's it, you can really here go with the observe and interact and gardeners and people like that do it kind of intuitively because i was just going to say she's she's a gardener so she does it intuitively and, a, and an observer and a, you know and and and, and 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 it's an ongoing process so what you notice is is that no matter on what level it is but if, if you have elements strategically in the right place and then the function that almost flows from them without seemingly without doing anything because it's just like well you've got to put the trash somewhere where's it going to go what's going to go in the right place where now it's going to you know that's actually no harder than putting it in the wrong place or not having you know so forth and 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 <clears throat> so there's a kind of strategic thinking and 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 seeing it as a, a, an ongoing process of dealing things around until they feel like they're in the right place. Caroline. Yes. Um, okay, I wanted to say that, um, or even wood chips, if added into the, the compost bin, also help. Yes. Yeah, mm, that was about the compost. Uh, earlier on, Steve had talked about um, us being able to showcase the work that we are doing, you know, and uh, I think that's a very good idea because um, of late, I've really gone out and I'm working with so many different people and uh, it is very nice. It is a learning experience. I'm always learning something new. And uh, yes, I think that would add value to our persons as permaculture teachers and practitioners. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Caroline. Um, yeah, so what we've done step one is we've started this whatsapp group and i think just for now we'll we can put uh, images and chat in the whatsapp group and encourage you know let, let, let us comment and interact with each other's posts and have little discussions around them but i i i think that that's the first step then to moving into something that's a bit more complex and a bit more functional like what we were just then discussing so um i'm, I'm great i'm glad, uh, grateful for that comment karen thank you um greetings to gerald
Welcome Gerald, we're just uh, getting into our stride a little bit. Um, I hope you've had a good day. Um, yeah, okay. Well, let's, 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 let's get started and we can uh, receive other people as they, uh, as they, as they, as they arrive. And um, I've prepared a little slideshow here. Oops. Okay, so the theme is um, principle 12, principle 11, sorry, Holmgren's principle 11, which is, it's about edges. And I think <coughs> with, we're thinking about design, we're thinking about permaculture design, which is going to create we're going to, a design that supports functions and that as we've moved into it, we've, we've talked about valuing diversity. And one of the ways that we create or we access or interact with diversity is by having edges. There has to be an interface between one thing and another. Um, and, and also very interesting things happen at edges. So, um, use edges and value the marginal that's that's the statement and um the saying that um david holman gives us is, is quite an interesting one it says just because you're on a well-beaten path doesn't mean that you're on the right track so it's warning us not to just follow the well-beaten path. It's saying, look to the edges and value the marginal. Don't just follow what everyone else is doing or don't fail to see the value in those other areas. So it, 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 it speaks quite directly to principle 10 about valuing diversity. But now we're talking about how we might do that. And within our designs, the key is to create as many edges as we can and learn how to read how that might, what opportunities that might offer us. Okay, so there's, there's our, our opening thought. Um, so the edge effect. This is a, a, a picture from Bill Mollison's designer's manual. And we're seeing a standard agricultural wire fence. And there's a gate post, fence post, and some barbed wire on the top. And so, and not a very, uh, not an edge that seems to offer much opportunity, not a very interesting edge, perhaps, but. we still get microclimate effects. We get subtle differences. So where the wind blows and interacts with the fence, it will slow the wind slowly. And there's going to be a gathering of leaves and organic matter is going to accumulate just at the bottom of that fence, a slightly unique set of conditions. Another thing that might happen is birds might rest and pause on those gateposts, on that wire. And when they do so, they might drop little parcels of, of, of phosphate and seeds <clears throat> that might <clears throat> have a high, more likely to lodge in and maybe germinate, less likely to be trodden on, less likely to uh, be found by a grazing animal because it's tight up against an edge. So even, <clears throat> even just something as simple as defining a barrier um, and creating an edge between field A, field B, or you know whatever whatever this is, 
is we created a unique set of differences that favor different kinds of species. They give opportunities for different kinds of things to happen. Um, so look, plants are now beginning to grow up and utilize the fact that there's a fence post, that there's some mesh, and that there's slightly uh, improved soil or humidity conditions, potentially along this edge. So we might just observe that process happening in our home, in our garden, in our wherever we might see that, or we and, and we might ask ourselves, how can we utilize that? Could we use this edge effect to an advantage? You know, it might be, give me a clue of where I might want to plant. You know, I've created wind shelter. I've, I mean, I've changed the conditions ever so slightly. So Bill, in the book, he says, um, maybe some edges are compatible and incompatible. Um, is, is there always a difference in yield or stability? Is one benefit at the benefit of the, at the expense of the other or, or, or the edge effects you know, mutually beneficial? Um, explores the, the different options there. So ask ourselves the question about is this edge effect, you know, it might have a damaging effect to the fence. It might cause the, the fence to rot more. That, uh, that, and if the primary function of the system is to keep out animals, it isn't to create a succession. We can ask ourselves that question, but we're observing and interacting and learning and seeing that, in, in, that nature is in some way catching and storing energy and building more diversity of yields from edges. So there's, there's, there's a simple observation that we're now going to take into our designed thinking brains. Edges, the surface or this unique set of conditions between, you know, where two different things come together. Think about edges as either also is, we, we had this branching pattern when we looked at, at patterns earlier on and the dendritic pattern, but a simple idea of, we start with a single unit and we double the amount of units and we halve the length. And if we repeat that a few times, we very quickly come to the tree pattern, the branching pattern, the, uh, the, the, the little tributaries and rivulets that might come together to form a river, or looking at the other way around, a root system, a dispersal system. Um, nature exploits edges in many ways. Think about the surface area of root mass. And then think about how those roots fuse with mycorrhizal fungi and create ever, ever more finer branching uh, patterns which interact with the environment in an in a ever, you know, ever subtler microscopic kind of way. So, um, edges are kind of coming together or diffusing apart. We thought a lot about these sort of mycelial nets and patterns as well. Right, so, um, so, <clears throat> so <clears throat> think about how nature is exploiting the edge effect to create surface area and to allow all sorts of nutrient exchange to, to come about. And when we thought about the mycelial patterns before, we also realize that that branching, also when the branching ex responds to the environment, that represents in, 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 an information pattern as well. And so we can also think about how information networks and our human connection, um, about how we disseminate permaculture education. Think about that as edges. Which so <clears throat> I'm going to say greetings to Simon and to say that the theme this week is about using edges and value, valuing the marginal. And we started off chatting a little bit earlier as well about 
our sort of collective ambition as a team, as people interested in permaculture, members of the sector. Yes, I, I do. Greetings. Um, how we can best work together moving forward. And so let's also think about permacult permaculture as an information system that we are disseminating. Um, um, we, we looked at a couple of these slides before. I just thought I'd pop, pop them back in again to um, just to remind us. This is another lovely edge picture um, in the Bill's Designers Manual. And we're seeing a, a freshwater stream flowing into, I think, like a little estuary. And um, it's entitled Edges and Surfaces. And so you can imagine, here's, here's our little river or stream, and, and it's coming down the hill, and the cold water, um, fresh water flowing flowing into the into the into the stat existing water, and think about how that the uh, the flowing water might mix and interact with the water that's there already. It's going to create subtle differences. Um, you can imagine as we go deeper down into the lake. Um, it, it, it'll become from light to dark. So there's going to be an edge in that way. There's going to be a temperature edge. The water on the surface will be slightly warmer. As we go down, it will be cooler. Um, so we're looking at so many different edges. And I thought, let's just explore this and think about how this picture might represent so many different types of habitat that would allow so many different types of species, plant or animal, fungi, algae, snails, everything you can think of, how they might fit within this system. Um, and how this, these different edges create so many different niches because we've got this huge spectrum of different opportunities. So, uh, the first one um, edge we can think about is just the between the air and the water and things like little pond skaters that go on the surface of the water or um, la insects that lay their larvae that hang just from the meniscus on, uh, of the water just below the surface. Think about all the different action, interactions going on between the air and the water, exchange of gases, exchange of humidity and, and, and so many other different things going on. Um, so number two, second edge that we're looking at is where fresh water is coming in and mixing with salty water. So we're getting, we've got a fresh brackish water edge. We've got a warm, cool water edge here, number three. Um, around number four, we've got the flowing water interacting with the, the still water, another kind of edge. Number five is we've got grasses coming down to the water edge. So it might favor certain kinds of amphibians that maybe want to spend some of the time in the water and then come onto the land. Um, we've got a set of conditions there that aren't, it's slightly different, isn't it? It's not the field, it's not the hot, dry pasture, and it's not the, the, the flowing of the water. It's a wet, marshy bit, grassy bit on the edge. Uh, number six, we've got uh, marsh here. Look, we've got another kind of wetland. Um, seven, as we go down, we can see we've got a, 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 an edge between the aerobic topsoil and the anaerobic subsoil. Uh, and we've soil, subsoil edge at eight. Um, the stream and the bank at nine. Brackish and salty water down at ten. Um, Well, we've got a forest um, edge here coming down into into the water, and the last one, fourteen, is 
the, the, the edge between the, the mud on the bottom and the and the, the water above that. There will be creatures, plants, organisms that want to exploit every one of those little edges and it gives it a slightly unique set of conditions and 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 therefore that leads to a diversity of species. A diversity of species that interact with each other, predator-prey relationships, food chains, food webs, nutrient cycles, which ultimately creates a really stable system. Stability comes from diversity. That was the lesson from the previous um, uh, principle. And now we're seeing how we can achieve diversity by exploring and embracing edges and, and then taking this insight and bringing that into our design work. Again, drawn from, I think from permaculture two, uh, um, a, we're looking down in a plan view now at a house and garden with an inner permaculture styley. And um, we've got some interesting edges to create a useful interface between the flow of people in and out of the house and the land around the house. And we can see these are the keyhole paths, which perhaps encourage gardening in uh, 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 people plant interactions, um, paths that lead to a little chicken area. Um, I'm always really interested in the space between the house and the garden. There's such an interesting edge, patios and verandas and, um, you know, shaded areas and, and we could grow grapes up them or you know, climbers and uh, 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 passion fruits or I don't know. Um, that edge space around the house is really important. and. It's not quite inside, it's not quite outside. Often we can have the best of both worlds in, in, in that area. And then we might the patio in this circumstance flows out onto a lawn, which maybe is like an extension almost of the house, but an outdoor space and lawns nice for the kids to run around on or play a game of shuttlecock or something. <clears throat> and we've put placed that strategically all next to the house so when the weather's nice we come out onto our edge space of patio and then we can edge into a slightly tamed and manicured part of the of, of, of what might be a more complex or productive garden <clears throat> so <clears throat> interesting use of edges awareness of edges and the use of um Yes, yeah, so, so yes, yes. Um, thinking about edges around the house and that interface. So it's always going to be most productive. The part of the garden that's going to be most productive is where you can reach it from the path, where you can see what's going on, where you can go, oh, there's a strawberry there. Oh, there's a, there's a, you know, I, there's, I can interact that, that herb is looking nice. Make, pick that for my tea. Um, so edges okay, I'm, I'm not laboring the point a bit maybe but is it's like the edge of it gives us a third unique um, and, 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 and this example we've got an aquatic system and we've got a and we want to explore the bit that's both. We want to create those interfaces because there's, there's opportunities for all of the elements in this system to somehow interact with this system through the earth. Um, there, there might be, um, this is, uh, 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 there's our imagined edge effect environment and these are these elements the species living within it and we've got um this area and then only three on the uh very variation of three on this side but in this example we're seeing nine in the overlap area 
and think about how different nutrient cycles or different regulatory cycles might all overlap through this edge effect, through this edge area. So when we see, we want to tidy the edges along rivers and streams and, and have a southern hard edge from grass to water, we're missing out all of these different potential edge opportunities um, where we get these very unique sets of conditions that we um, are thinking about. Um, I just say greetings to uh, January and welcome to the session. The, the, the theme is around edges and valuing the marginal. And I'm going to be using these ideas to propose also how we might work together, how we might engage in creating edges where we can communicate and spread permaculture far and wide across our communities. That, that's our collective goal. And the, 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 the take home from this, this principle really is that we, is we can, when we design, when we build something, um, we, could, we can try and optimize this the idea of the, of the edge effect. And we get, somehow get a unique set of conditions where two different systems overlap. And there can be many benefits. So we've just seen an example of distribution of species between water and land. And we've seen that there's a greatest diversity of the ones that live in the marshy bit at the edge. Interesting. Um, we've, we're, we <clears throat> can look at a, a woodland system and see how in imagine that the this is the sunny side the south facing side from the northern hemisphere um that deep in the forest interior there's less diversity because there's very little light penetrating and reaching the forest floor um whereas on the side that's open to this to the sun to that is we've got um sort of gradual stepped edge between large herbaceous plants giving way to more shrubby plants and small trees we've still got understory plants because there's still light coming through and so we have this greater diversity at the edge and um, a greater number of species are going to hang out around here because it's a bit more light, it's a bit more diversity, and they can go out and graze in the grass. They've got the shelter of the forest and back into. So we're seeing in, in different ways how we can value these edges and see how we might bring these ideas into design. Um, Imagine an island and these two uh, sides have the same surface area but on this one we have one big island so we've got one lot of interior habitat and we've got a certain amount of edge habitat and the species distribution again seeing the same conditions as what we've seen in previous slides is we get the, a greater range of diversity around the edges and this is the kind of the archetype that we want to hold into our minds but when we're designing we might design deliberately to you know to minimize or to have a certain a scale of edge effect or we might want to maximize that to create as many possible interactions as much variation as we can our designs always follow the function that's intended uh, <clears throat> if we want to create something simple we might look at this model and if we want something that has enormous diversity and the potential of, of interactions then we might look at the fragmented model um, so this is just our deliberate design approach and we're thinking about how that edge effect 
might be something which we can work with. It's a very, very powerful thing. Um, here's a nice just diagram. I was Googling around earlier and it also uses the word ecotone, uh, which I kind of liked, which is again exploring this overlap area where the mountain gives way to the forest, the forest gives way to the to the marshland, and then the marshland gives way to the lake. And then each between each one of those different environments, we're going to have these very interesting, unique, diverse areas. And here's the thing is in farming, in agriculture, always tend to try and homogenize the environment. We the woodlands, we drain the swamps, and we try and make the land all the, as the same as possible. So we have to understand that in trying to suppress that edge effect, we're requiring ourselves, instead of benefiting from it, we're now putting huge amounts of energy into trying to cancel it out to, to create uniformity. And we have to remember that when we fight against, when we try to create uniformity, we're fighting against nature. Nature wants to be complicated. Nature is, wants to create edges. Nature, over time, becomes more diverse. So if we want to keep a weed-free, controlled environment, we've got to continually put energy into that. The culture is telling you to go the other way is embrace the diversity, work with the edges, and explore the, the multiple benefits of allowing nature to, effect, to flow and present its own design. It's, it, it's always trying to adjust itself. Um, and, and the more to self-regulate, and so the more we interact with it, the more we actually stop that from happening. Again, another nice picture, um, exploring the diversity of elements in the soil, of insects, fish populations, large predators, small birds, and are we going around grazing animals and wild animals, and burrowing animals and predatory bears, um, um, and, and, and thinking about a natural environment where we have enormous amounts of edges. We've got a, a deviating, meandering river with banks of sediments and different deposits and areas of erosion. And, and we've got woodland regenerating uh, and, and steep slopes and lower slopes. And, and these are the environments that favor diversity. And, and, and again, it's, this is kind of what nature naturally wants to do and what agriculture always wants to push back against. These are your templates for your designs to, and, and to think about those natural flows and patterns and to end this, this edge effect. So um, just a very simple illustration, just to think, just to understand in design, we could create exactly the same thing, a pond of square meterage, the one has double the edge of, as the other. This one has twice the opportunity for insects and tadpoles and frogs and newts and things to climb in and out of the pond. Um, and for there to be interactions between the plants and the water and the water and the plants and the organisms that enjoy both of those conditions. So you do, you're designing to maximize the edge. You're designing to maximize interactions and, and in the process, embracing diversity and creating the possibility for all sorts of unplanned things to happen, actually, um, because nature in its complexity is there's way too much going on, but we have to allow it to express itself. And as permaculture designers, we're interacting with that to create outcomes that we need to meet our needs. That, that, that's the rule, that's all, that's our thinking. So last week in, um, before we talked about Wakeland's farm, agroforestry research farm in Suffolk. And I've come back to that to show how, let's just say, there's an awful lot of edges. And contrast that to the monoculture farming going on around it. 
And um, clearly, there's a massive lesson there. And um, the Wendlands Farm has proved that um, using their agroforestry techniques, their soil is accumulating, they're building a carbon rich soil, and the biodiversity on the land has increased. And the total yield, although they've given up some of the space to trees and tree crops, the total yield is 1.4 times higher than the surrounding landscape, maybe more, uh, depending on how you measure inputs and outputs. Uh, clearly something is going on there, and clearly it's something to do with edges. Here's a fun picture I found again on the internet to do my research. And you might say, imagine again, we've, we've looked at different edges and different things. If you were working with a group or you're working with some children, you might say to them, you know, explore a picture like this and tell me how many edges you can see how this represents an interesting design. We've got um, the street going past. So we, the, 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 and clearly there's some kind of retail shopping thing going on here um, that we've, the, the, the owner of this building is exploring the edge between their space, whether that's a retail space or a home, we don't know, and here's, here's the public space outside. So we've got a, a, a private zone against a public zone, and we've got some lovely gardens and things. I don't know if this produce we can buy or, 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 or we're just enjoying looking at it, but we've got a little for sale shop here. And so look also how the strategic placement of these planters creates an edge, but also it, it, it softens the impact between perhaps the home space and the public space. Um, we've got a carefully espaliered uh, fruit trees there, look, creating another edge. And look, they've been uh, trained along this, this trellis, which then defines the, uh, again, the yard space for the house. So that, it's almost make, making the space bigger by coming out defining the edge and then going up and then growing something on that surface. We've got another little overlap edge space because we've got um, a little, um, what can we call that, a little conservatory roof thing to create a bike park and maybe some refuse or something there. And then we've got another little edge space before going into the house. Um, look how they've taking use of this vertical wall, we've got climbers going up there. And, but you know, you can go on and on. Think about really creative use of edges to fulfill functions. Function might be to create a bit of privacy, a bit of a barrier, a windbreak, but also to invite people to, to signpost where people can go and where they can't go. It's just good placement in a design. Um, yeah, we've, we've looked a lot about uh, swales and water treatment. Think about how we can really use edges, banks, vertical space really creatively. Um, and um, we're going to have a range of different conditions as we explore up this edge. Um, so we look at everything as an opportunity. You see past the limits, you say, well, that's that's really steep. I can't cultivate that bit of land. Or well, we're going to have a, a different style of approach. Um, we talked about paths, being the, the, the edge between the garden, the gardener, you and the garden. And we can show people where we want them to go. We can make it easy for them to access what's around and, um, Again, just by sips, it can be very, it doesn't have to be as formal as this, with nice brick edges or whatever, but we can signal where we want people to go, create a flow, and then that creates another productive and useful edge. Uh, another kind of vertical um, edge being explored. Um, and I just, again, just stumbled across this image, but um, 
uh, 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 on the, the zones and, and thinking, we've, we've talked about this uh, slightly abstract idea, but the, the, the zoning where uh, zone one is our home zone, that's where we live and where we put the things that we need regularly and daily. We might have little salad and herb gardens. And, but then it's just to think about this edge between zone one and zone two and where, what, where, where we might place things according to the frequency of how we interact with them. And um, I think about how a pathway through these different zones then creates another kind of edge. So we're going to visit this part of zone two more frequently um, because we've created a, a, a pathway that way. Um, so anyway, there we go. There's just a few things to warm us up on, on the topic and get, get us going. And um, I always do that, I get a bit carried away by my, okay. Um, okay, so we're thinking about edges. You've got that as a concept. I think I've, I've gone into it enough. Um, but let's also say, let's think about how we abstract that idea as well. I try to um, oops. Hmm. trying to be clever with two screens, but it doesn't quite work all the time. I made it too big as well. Sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. There we go. Got it. Okay. Um, we should now be seeing the website. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, um, so we're all on a journey and we're 21 weeks into this and we've been learning about permaculture design and permaculture design as a tool to help us work with change and to face some of the challenges that we're facing because of change being a, a, like a continual process. And we're, we're now well into this now. So I want to take a few steps back and talk about I don't know where, 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 where this is going, what we do next and why, the, why we created an Academy of Permaculture. And, um, so this, this picture is of the edge between England and Wales. The hills and the mountains are Wales and the, the plain down there is England. Um, and this is uh, Trevlak Farm, where I've been teaching permaculture and working with them for 13 years, or well, since 2010. <coughs> and it's interesting that it sits on, it sits on an interesting edge, just between two countries, between the hill and the, the plain, between the much rougher farming land, the hilly land, and a Shropshire Plain, which is very lush farming land. So we, we, we've got two sets of conditions here all together. And the people like me that live in Wales, because it's a lot cheaper and, but there's less economic opportunity and you know, it's a certain set of conditions that suit me. And if you go and live on the England side, then it's much more busy and there's cars and traffic and life's more expensive and more busy. <clears throat> so that suits a certain kind of people as well. 
And then there's those of us that kind of live along the edge. And in some ways we can benefit from both environments. And that's just happens to be where this farm is and where we've built a friendship over, over the years. And um, it's been a place where I've been able to invite people to come and learn about permaculture and enjoy being in nature and, but also be confronted with the very real challenge of how do we produce food? How do we make a viable enterprise through our interactions with the natural world? And one of the things that we've tried to do at the farm over the years is to understand how we create edges. We're physically on this edge, but we want to create an interface between the farm and the people who buy our food. Um, we want um, uh, to build a relationship with customers. Um, and, and rather than spending all the effort to distribute food far and wide, we want that to be very local. So you're going to think about that, that branching pattern. Think about that, that as, a, as, a, as a reaching out into a community and, and, and think about how we might go about, you know, trying to create these opportunities. Um, yeah. Welcome everyone who's arriving. Um, we're talking about edges. And I'm talking about, I live on the edge between England and Wales and two and of two different types of farming but it's quite a unique set of conditions really but and we're just close enough to the market of england to, be able to invite uh to, to the farms more accessible let's say from bringing people into wales so many kinds of edges um we try to connect with people who are interested in the kind of farming that we're doing it's permaculture it's regenerative it's holistic holistic management so that there are networks that we can reach out to of people perhaps across the country or across europe who have that specific interest but there are networks we want to make to people who live just a few miles away who might want to come and visit and inter interact with the farm in a different way so Part of the, of the plan is being to open up different kinds of edges for retail, for, uh, uh, for, for, for recreation, for study and learning, uh, for people perhaps who need rehabilitation or uh, relaxation to come out into the countryside. All of these are strategies to build diversity. Okay, anyway. Um, I've said this before, but every here is our PDC here on the right. I have created a page for every week. And here we are at 21 at edges and margins. And we're going to have a little look at that. So The mission statement for Sector 39 is to bring new people into contact with permaculture. The reason we exist is to put it out there and, and, and to form alliances with, with different people and different groups to create a, a mutual support network, to create that branching pattern and to create the possibility for permaculture to grow and grow very quickly. And um, I think that's the motivation behind the the, the, the academy and that's what I think that we should now be thinking about as a group is how do we develop this idea in a way in which it meets all of our needs for our own mutual benefit okay um and I just go back to this web page and one of the things that is really pressing in my mind, and I don't want to, to alarm everyone, but this is the climate change graph that looks at the changes in temperature going back over the last 150 years. 
150 per year. Okay, and what we can see is here's a background pattern is that the average temperature each year in the northern hemisphere is different, it changes. And look, and that's what we're seeing this black wiggly line is the average temperature for each year. Here we are, 1880, 1885, up and down, wiggle, wiggle, up and down it goes. So against that background of wiggle, wiggle, up and down, it's hard to see the actual trend. Now remember, the sins of our father are visited unto the seventh generation. If you're not paying attention in the shorter term and things go wildly out and there's a long-term impact. And look at all this variation. You can see how it, it's difficult to spot the trend. But here's the trend. Here's the, here's the red line. And look, it's, it's, it's also varied. But it started to climb, noticeably climb, at the turn of the 20th century. And climb it did. This is the average temperature anomaly um as observed on the northern hemisphere and we're seeing the averages and they go up and down every year but this trending line climbs and at, at about 1980 at the time when the world was beginning to think more seriously about climate change and seeing this trend uh, started forming the IPCC in the 80s and building up to 1990, the first IPCC reports and the obviously the, the Rio Earth Summit of 1992 is scientists are saying, guys, there's a, kind of, there's a problem. We need to change our path of development. We need to go in a different direction because we're seeing now a very worrying long term trend. And for sure, it's hard to see year by year. Look at all these ups and downs, look at these enormous differences. And sometimes you might compare that year to that year and say, well, the problem's gone away. It's gone back to how it was 20 years ago. But the long term trend is undeniable. And it's the use of fossil fuels and it's the style of agriculture that we're doing. And it's driving this problem and it's accelerating. Now, <clears throat> whether we as individuals or groups or nations can do anything to stop it is another question. But what we know is <clears throat> we're heading rapidly to the 1.5 degrees of change target, maybe by 2030. And that starts getting a bit scary. So this this. There are, there are very powerful forces out there which are driving change. And when we think about how we're going to address that, we need to create a lot of edges. We need to understand also the impact that that will have on economic systems. So countries like ours in the United Kingdom where we import our food and we import a lot of our energy. We're a small country with a lot of people. Um, uh, 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 what would happen if those resources aren't, are disrupted because of severe climate events, droughts, floods, storms, and then the economic knock-on effect of farmers not being able to afford to replant their crops, or distribution lines breaking because of severe weather. So we've seen you know, horrendous floods in, in Italy right now, and Spain, and uh, you know, on it goes. We, wherever you, we've seen them in Burundi, we've seen them in Ethiopia. Um, um, so, let's not kid ourselves that this isn't happening, but then understand this, all we can do is to build our resilience. And we're going to do that with permaculture, and we're going to understand that we're going to design and build systems to support our own resilience. But in the process, we are learning. We're creating precedents. We're creating new experiences. And that also is part of the yield of the system. That's what we're creating is the knowledge of how to do this. And it becomes our responsibility 
and to our advantage is to share that knowledge through networks to allow that that awareness to spread so that we're surrounded also by stronger more resilient communities communities that will be better placed to help each other communities that are better organized and know how to organize from the bottom up so i've also given you this bioregional organization chart um, and i think that's something which we need to keep you know coming around back to and thinking about well this is what a support network is going to look like and I'm going to say to you, Gerald and, and Shanaz and, and, and Caroline, everyone else, Simon, Deborah, but is Sector 39 has to, in some way, our, our academy, what we create together, let's say that, what we create by working together um, needs to fulfill these functions. And, and I'm thinking that, that that's very much part of the design that we need to be you know, working on now. And um, I've, I've said again, the climate problem is real and, and that's going to create economic problem, challenges. Changes are given, but this is, gives us plenty of motivation to start organising. And, and we've talked about diversity and edges um, as, as really strong themes to be aiming at. Now, um, Here's another edge, is the youth edge. And um, I don't know if this will work if I try this playing it. Let me just try a little bit of this video. So this is uh, Laura. She's uh, in school in Kampala. And she is a youth climate activist. And I asked her to make a little video to communicate to us. And, and this is it. So let's just have a little look at this. better society involves a collective effort from everyone. We can start by being more conscious of our impacts towards the environment and reducing our carbon footprint. This can be done by the use of reusable bags, recycling and reducing our energy consumption. Prioritize climate action by reducing the greenhouse emissions and adapting to the impacts of climate change. Encourage the use of clean technologies energy efficiency and support research in sustainable solutions. Invest in climate resilient infrastructure and develop strategies to mitigate the effects of the extreme weather events. Encourage and support farming practices as well as mechanisms. By working together towards a common goal, we can create a society that is climate conscious, ecologically responsible and socially inclusive. Okay, lovely. I hope you <clears throat> came across. But it, 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 uh, it, it strikes me how important it is to open up different edges into different communities. So whether Laura is uh, uh, able to communicate her message and to inspire, you know, the youth in her, uh, uh, her part of the world, whether she can do that across the internet or not. But that, think about these um social edges and that and then then the challenge to turn well-meaning well-placed intention such as what she has how do we translate that into meaningful action that actually helps people you know, build resilience and meet their needs so we need more than just a campaign but we also need to understand that part of what we're doing in permaculture is we're communicating a very powerful message and we're doing it through actions and intentions um, um the in 2018 um uh, sector 39 were invited to trial um, a peer-to-peer -peer learning model for permaculture in uh, the uh, refugee settlements in West Nile. And uh, I went on to um, the UNHCR website uh, earlier today and 
I saw that um, there's about, oh, I've forgotten now, one, one and a half million refugees in Uganda currently. Um, that is the fifth most country. There's a lot of people currently outside of Syria, of Afghanistan and, and, and Ukraine. Uh, lots of people are fleeing from Venezuela and a, a great number of world's refugees have come from um, a, a few small countries and South Sudan, of course. Um, so, <clears throat> and, and that was another, if you like, another edge between Uganda and Sudan, but also is those people who are in the ecotone, in the overlap, they're refugees. So they're not, they're South Sudanese, but they're in Uganda. So they're in a unique, circumstance and it's and it's a new circumstance of what they had been in previously and what we found was that those people were very receptive or again the people that were recruited to work with our program were very were receptive to permaculture ideas especially when they could see that they were actually useful we weren't doing it just because we were you know trying to be nice we were doing it because, because we're giving people actual real skills and um, that was a very, very interesting experience. And we, we've, we've drawn on that, touched on that a little bit, but we, we ran a six month program in which 40 trainees were supported to go home and pass on their knowledge to three neighboring households. And then with a series of uh, outreach visits, we monitored and collected the feedback to see how the ideas translated across the community and many of the um initiatives uh seem to create their own momentum and the people that we trained went on to become trainers for unhcr so we we felt that we'd we passed on enough knowledge to allow our our tier one trainers to pass on their knowledge if you like to a tier two to, to pass that on we created uh, this training manual, uh, which you can reach off the page here. Um, we can have a quick, just a quick look at that. Um, I have mentioned it before. Um, whoops. Here it is. Um, so um, we created this manual um, as a really simple tool to aid teachers to talk about permaculture. And it's a little PDF. It can sit on a, on a smartphone or you can print it off in the local copy shop and, and, and use it as a teaching resource to begin to talk about permaculture. It's got the um, principles in it, the ethics, and then it's got our design tools our, our um, uh, invitation to come together around values and long-term goals, and then the basic tools of, um, of how the, the, the process, the sequence of design, hierarchy, and, and, and think about this sort of uh, uh, slow and steady learning model, and, and then to then start to bring those ideas and make them real around your habitat to think about edges and diversity and and inputs and outputs and exchanges um, strategic placement um, building set cycles and and, and creating multifunctional landscapes and um, we put in the eight forms of capital which we discussed and we also put in a, a, a template for how to design a basic lesson uh, uh, how to plan a, 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 a permaculture lesson and so we created this resource it's it's only about two megabytes it's very easy to download and um that was that's 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 that was a, a, an output from this training so again we tried to put the resource into the hands of so there was the edge between there was our training team and we met with the tier one trainers and we've given them um, 
training, we give them experience and visual tools so then they can communicate that information on to the people around them. The thing that we failed to add to that system was a feedback mechanism so that we could see how successful those outcomes were. And once we stopped visiting the area, we then didn't really get to see what happened next. Uh, we'd very much like to do that. Um, so here's, here's a question. Um, I think I've, I think we've looked at these. Okay. Um, okay, let's maybe let's just have a pause and have a chat because I've just done an awful lot of talking. Is um I'll stop the share, come back into the room and we'll have a bit of a let's have a bit of a chat. So there we go. I've laid out my sort of core ideas. What I want us to go to in the next part of the session is, is to talk about more, more, in a more focused way of how we might collaborate together to, to continue the work that we've initiated, but to allow poem culture to have the ability to spread far and wide and to identify. Um, so produce no waste. There's, there's principle six. We also have said opportunities lie in the waste stream. Unutilized resources lying around. Poem culture designers, we should be trying to get onto those. Uganda has the fifth highest population of refugees in the world right now, currently. Here's my thought. This, those people are at the margins. They're at an edge. They might be on the edge between the present and the future because they're in a, a transformational situation. There's been a breakdown in South Sudan or a breakdown in Congo. And people have crossed over the border for whatever reasons and they have to begin again. They have to begin again in the light of everything that's changed for them. So maybe before they had a particular kind of lifestyle, but they're going to have to construct a new one in their new location. Well, that new lifestyle needs to understand climate change. That new lifestyle has to actually fulfill all of these ecological and social ideas within permaculture. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Because non-sustainable lifestyles need loads of energy to sustain them. And that one thing that's not going to happen in Nachivali or Bidi Bidi or West Margi or anywhere else is for there to be a surplus of cheap energy and resources to use. That's not going to happen. Got to work from what we've got. So I think there's an enormous edge to be, exp not exploited sounds wrong, but to be explored. And it's this, this wave of displaced people and it's also understanding that that's going to keep happening around the world. We're going to have weather events. There's going to be economic turbulence. There will be people who will have to move. The, 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 the seas are rising. Um, so humanity has to learn how to migrate, how to reinvent and move around. Think about that. When we went to one of the refugee settlements, I don't want to in any way belittle the enormous and harrowing experiences that people have had. No one, no one becomes a refugee by choice. Um, but once that has happened, then there's a unique set of circumstances then are created, which is kind of an edge space, which is there to be utilized as an advantage. So and I think that there's, there's, there's a relationship here for us to exploit and exploit to develop is there's me as a permaculture teacher into 
interacting with you guys who are building that into your experience and you communicating that to your own environment and the people around you. That's, that's how permaculture works. And at the same time is, I see what you're doing, I'm learning from you and being inspired by you. We have a two-way communication. So I, I think that we're building our Academy of Permaculture is a coming together of all of us. It's something that we're creating by working together. And we are the teachers, we are the facilitators, we are nodes within that diffuse network. There's Deborah reaching out into communities around her. Shanaz connects with people around her, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, and I also then am not, am aware that there is this also, this huge human resource to be tapped into of displaced people. And um, we could look at that in the UK context, and we, we could really look at that in the Uganda and Kenya context, because many of those people have been interacting with us through this course. And what I'm hearing is uh, January there in, in, uh, in uh, Nachivali, and um, we've had Andre in, in, in Kakuma. And I know there's other groups, and I know there's permaculture things popping up in those areas, but so what can we do as an academy to link those people into our network and to enable that reach to, to, to penetrate into those communities more widely? Um, and yeah, okay. So I've got some more things to present and add, um, but that's, that's, this is where I'm kind of at at the moment in the thinking. So I want to pause and just see um, if anyone would like to chip in and um, yeah, Gerald, I'm going to hand it to you for a few minutes, if that's okay. Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. I, I think I couldn't say it any better. Um, we should, you know, expect questions from the rest of the team. Otherwise, it's always interesting. The whole concept of uh, ages and the marginal is really interesting. And the more you get to understand it, the, uh, the more interesting it gets and how you can apply it across the different sectors in life. And that's the beauty with promotion culture that you get to spread it across beyond gardening beyond uh, human sentiments even to social aspects or even economical aspects of society so um is anyone having any questions or any compliments i'll hand over You know, my, my enduring thought is, where's the leadership going to come from to bring about the changes that we need to see in the world? And I think that they're far more likely to come from those kind of places than anywhere else, because they're people that are not vested in the status quo. They're being forced to already create a new future for themselves. And I think that that's something that we should be looking at more, you know, really strategically. Simon, uh, thank you for your uh, maybe before comments. before Simon comes in, I had a very good conversation with uh, Dan Halling from uh, the association, the UK Association, and uh, part of the discussion we had was on how much uh, energy or kind of power is enclosed within those areas talk of Kakuma, then uh, Bidibidi, Nachivari, all those places, there is a lot of energy or a lot of vibrations that are setting off from such places. And just for the information of the members on the team, 
on the convention we are likely to have input uh, is still uh, a work in progress is still in the early stages but it's sort of con confirmed tentatively that you will have inputs from the team there is going to be a specific session which will be to hear from alternative practitioners and by alternative actually it shouldn't be the alternative what we are seeing here should be the mainstream because that's where it's really really impactful over to you simon yes uh, good evening good evening to everyone uh, now the principal was talking of us reaching uh, those refugee settlement to impact those people with the knowledge of pharmacology principles and method methodology of how to produce the food and access to the but now our challenge is yes we have gotten now the skills and knowledge that we have acquired <laughs> uh, from the knowledge uh, from the training but now how i a person from from eastern region I have got that interest of giving out the knowledge and the, the experience and the skills and the principles that I've acquired from the from from the PDC class to go to a place like Kakuma, uh, Southern Sudan. Uh, I've got a challenge of the transportation system and then the the identification system that I really am a person that have come from sector 39. Uh, my effort here is to give you this and this and this and this, or to share this and this to you, such that the community will come to know how to get knowledge of uh, food security, how they can produce, how they can implement the principles and the tools of permaculture. I don't know how sector 39 and the admin leader will arrange that for a person like me who is willing to leave my home to go and uh, impact that knowledge to those people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Simon, thank you. And, and, and the answer to that is, well, we're going to explore that as a theme in, in, as, as we go forward. And there's, there's different ways in which we all might be able to contribute, um, whether it is physically traveling there or maybe we facilitate visits from people there to come and see other projects or uh, obviously, we use the internet and, and and so forth. But firstly, just to say, Simon, you are learning and having direct experience by working there with these ideas in your community. That knowledge then becomes an asset that other people can really benefit from. And that's that. how we achieve that is going to be, we've got to do some planning and problem solving. But we can see there that there's something of great value and the achievements of TAPA and and you've built networks, you've seen what worked, you've had some challenges in other areas. All of this is your lessons that you're learning. And the academy network is going to be stronger and better if we can uh, uh, you know benefit from your from the, your experiences. That, that, that's that's for sure. Um, so thank you for those comments. Thank you. And you're fully getting where I'm going really, it's great. Um, 
anyone else that would like to contribute? Or I can carry on. Oh, Caroline. Yeah, uh, actually, you're right because um, what happened when I when I attended my first PDC in 2021 November, and uh, Paul actually facilitated on that uh, PDC or the world, and uh, it was an eye opener for me because there were less women, very few, maybe five. And uh, when I, you know, I was one of the few who attended the whole course throughout and followed it. So it was like a light bulb just, you know, lit in my mind and I was like, this thing is, you know, is so useful. It's so, so useful. And I was like, this would impact mama's life differently, you know? Because you would have less work to do once your uh, systems are established, you know? And things, it would make life that much easier for the mamas. So I remember the first thing was like, how can I spread this gospel around where I live? I've been a gender activist all my life. I was like, this would be an answer to a lot of the women's issues, you know, food and nutrition security. And uh, you could also earn, especially from the food forest, you know. So I started teaching this uh to the local women and uh i'm saying it's been very satisfying in fact the pdc that ended like maybe three weeks ago this particular lot of women are very very inspiring in their weekly meeting because i could not teach take all the women because of resources so in the weekly meetings the ones who were there all the women who attended, you are told to facilitate, you know, to stand up and share with the class, share with the group what you learned, the new thing that you learned, because you went for training for 10 days. So they want to know what did you leave that place with, you know? And um, they have started doing the mandala garden, the raised bed, you know? the kitchen garden and um i think for me i'm very happy about that because if i talk like 30 women and they are doing all this they go back to their homes and they are doing all these crazy things you know um the other people will be like their neighbors wherever they come from will be like oh we want to see what are these crazy things you people are doing What's the difference? And I can imagine that we'll be able to, you know, change a lot of lives, a lot of people's thinking, and we'll also address climate change issues because that is basically what we are trying to do with all these food forest things. Because we are telling the mamas that you don't have to cut down trees in order to grow your food. Incorporate the trees into your system, you know, they play a role. So I'm so excited. And uh, at the same time, right now, I want to start working with children because when you give children some 10, 20 trees, you know, fruit trees together with the indigenous trees, the children will spend most of their time taking care of these trees. If it is during the dry season, I'm sure they will water the trees, you know? And once they water the trees and take care of them, they'll be very protective. And in that way, I believe the forest cover, like in my part of Kenya, the forest cover is under 2%. I believe using the children as change agents 
Um, I think I'll succeed. Thank you. <laughs> That's great, yeah. Um, okay, well, should we do, do we? Uh, uh, yeah, Deborah. Hi, Deborah, please. We're not hearing you. Oh. Yeah, this is from uh Sorry. Yes. Uh, I was also wanted to contribute on the side. I heard you talking about the refugees. Yes, refugees are uh, there. I've been talking with Andrew and uh, from Kaguma. Uh, so, uh, like Simon contributed, how can we reach those people from the refugee camps? Uh, I wanted to contribute, but it is like uh, we are the team, we are developing a team. We have been sharing on our knowledge and skills on the permaculture approach. So now, like uh, planning for, uh, for impacting the, the refugees, we ask the team and the people to come together to plan how we can reach our neighbors. Because like me, when I completed my PDC, the, the first thing was uh, I developed a worker plan. How am I going to start to reach my neighbors? Because permaculture says, first of all, you start, it starts with you, your family. So first of all, I started to plan with my family. How can I start this? How can I reach my children? Like Simon has not been he has not attended a PDC. This is the first time Simon to attend a PDC. Now I can ask him, as my younger child, that as per now, how many members have you impacted in your community before we reach to the refugee camps? Like me, uh, I've been moving around more than even five groups because the first time I reached uh, one group of eight members, of which I didn't introduce them much to the Etapa group before I formed the five ones. That's what I'd also wanted to contribute. But before we start, we needed to plan as a group, as a team, not only sector 39, but as the, the permaculturists, we need to organize ourselves to plan well, but how can we reach our brothers outside there? The comes. So thank you everyone for listening. Caroline, if you want to come back, please. Yes, um, I want to tell Deborah because she's very elusive. She's always, I think, working. You know, she's one of uh, Deborah. You're one of the people that I really look up to when I see your work, and I'm hoping one day sooner rather than later I shall be able to pay your visit. You really inspire me, Deborah. Thank you so much. Okay, Yari. Thank you so much. I um 
Yes, thank you for that, Caroline. And 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 I I, I really agree. One of the things that we got from uh, Stella's research um, when she did some feedback visits was many of the trainees had said they would like more training. They would like to visit other people's places to see examples and, and they always need tools and seeds. Um, and and I, I've thought about the the visits and the, the that that cross pollination is so powerful. When I've come over on my trips recently, I've always tried to, you know, bring people together from different areas. We took uh, Deborah to Kenya to see Paul and how he was doing his thing there, at Perma Africa, for example. And so I'm thinking that facilitating those kinds of training visits is, is a very good way we can support each other and we can invite each other into our communities or if we have a, a training center. All of these things take resources. There's, there's, and, and, and as soon as we want to travel out, there's, there's expenses and there's transport, there's accommodation and there's, and if we go and work in with people, say, in a refugee settlement and we need some lunch, we need, you know, whatever, there's always resources. So this is this is our reality. I've, I've really enjoyed hearing what people were saying and very much that we learn it by doing it to ourselves, to our family and then to the community. And, and, and Deborah really has showed us a shining example there of how she's how to do that. And and then so again, opening up edges and hubs reaching out into community and starting off something that uh, uh, in time becomes an entity of its own, has a life of its own. This is what Paul has done at Homer Bay. He's reached out to at least 12 different villages or communities and trained people within them to start their own initiatives. So I think we've got a very interesting model to follow. And I think if we're going to think about how we might reach out and support our, our friends, our neighbours in the refugee settlements is we need to have a plan and it and, and needs to have some resources attached to it. So um, that's what I was going to talk about next. So um, I, I thank you very much for everyone for the contributions. Uh, that's very illuminating. So it was good. And it took a little while to hear you, Deborah, but once we heard you, your voice was very clear. So, yeah, just so you know, we, we, we heard you clearly. And I sent you a message as well earlier to, to Tapper, so we'll, we'll, we can talk about that another time. Okay. Um. Okay, so... Ger uh, Gerald, yeah. Would you want us to have the break now for 10 minutes and then be back at 20 first? Okay, sure. Yeah. All right. See, okay, you see everyone in, in, in about 10 minutes.
Okay, if you let, if, um, let me know when you're back, and I'll start again in a moment or two. Okay, well, it's 20 past now. It's a designated time, so I will carry on. We seem to have had a couple of drop-offs, though, which is a shame. Uh, all right. Okay, well, we can think about how we do this. So welcome back, everyone. Um, <coughs> oh, dear. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so I put the training manual in there to remind you there's a resource that you might want to reference and also, um, yeah, to open up that conversation about <clears throat> sharing our skills and knowledge with people in different places and opening up <coughs> edges, connections, ways in which we can learn and grow and share information. Um, I've mentioned, <coughs> I've mentioned this, uh, Griffin project. <coughs> um, growing real food for nutrition. <coughs> As enterprise created in a, a community interest company, so a social enterprise created in the UK to link to farmers, growers around the world, especially those involved in permaculture, organic, regenerative, <clears throat> I think what they call natural farming. So <clears throat> the main thesis, the main idea behind this project is <clears throat> to, <clears throat> it's, it's like a public science project encourage people to think about the quality of the food that they're eating you can join the organization um there's um a bunch of information here but <coughs> excuse me basically what 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 they have um 
learnt is <coughs> using uh, this particular tool. <coughs> um, squeezing the sap from a leaf and then <coughs> dropping um, he's squeezing the sap out of the leaf that he's growing and we're seeing a little drop of um, here we go, go again, sorry. Here we go, here's the drop of sap. And he's dropping it onto this lens. A couple of drops of the plant juice and close the slide. <clears throat> and then just allow the natural light to shine through it. And <clears throat> what that is revealing is the denser the nutrients in the sap of the plant, the healthier the plant, the more the light bends when it comes through the lens. And it gives you a reading between zero and 30. And it tells you the percentage of sugar in the sap of the plant. And <clears throat> the higher that value, the higher the quality of your food is it's more nutrient dense <clears throat> what the um, <clears throat> the project sets about to do is to collect the evidence and the data to see <clears throat> <clears throat> what's the correlation what's the relationship between plants food plants of high nutrient density <clears throat> and the soil that they're grown in <clears throat> and the evidence that's coming back is that natural farming methods give you a much more nutrient dense food that also <clears throat> tastes better and lasts longer. So there are multiple benefits. <clears throat> what we suggest, what we think is that would be so interesting would be to begin to measure the quality of the food that people are growing who are using the permaculture methods and we would like to think about how we could reach out through our permaculture network to begin to gain some of this information and the, the, the primary way which we might which we're going to do that is um we just have one of these tools, so we have to start somewhere. And that's currently with our team in Rwanda. And um, we're going to do some research in Rwanda, and then we're going to bring this back to Uganda. And we're going to make it available to uh, TAPA members and Butobala members to use it to tell us about the quality of the food you're growing. Now, obviously, this needs a bit of training and a bit of support to make it happen. But with data, if we can collect the evidence, understand slightly better the impact that we're having, then that puts us in a situation <clears throat> to go out and look for resources to do a follow on project. So um, we, we just come through um, a period where well, we've come through a very difficult period because of COVID-19. But <clears throat> since for three years, Sector 39 had a small amount of money, which, which is what we used to develop the, the academy and run some PDCs, do two or three visits uh, out to Uganda. That's what's got us to this stage. And um, those funds are now all used up. And we're in a situation where we're looking to see what comes next. And um, the thing that has come out through discussions with the people behind this BRICS measuring project with Griffin Network is they're also um, interested in permaculture and natural farming and 
working with edges, working with people and reaching vulnerable people. That's led us to, to look at um, <clears throat> a question is, um, could we build a vision? Let's, could, could we use our PDC to create a vision um, which we could perhaps put into a funding bid and put it out there and you know, let's ask the universe, let's, let's, what can we do? So the UNHCR, that's the United Nations Conference on Refugees, um, has an innovation fund for projects which are refugee-led. That means defined and influenced by people who are in that position. And um, we have between now and the end of June to think about putting in um, an outline bid. So what could we win through doing such a bid? And the answer is they're offering financial support. Um, 45,000 US dollars in funding to test and implement ideas with strong community approaches that generate value for community members, not specifically linked to any thematic area or technology. So something that's going to create value for community members. Um, they will offer program and project management support. So they'll help us run the project. They offer technical support, expertise and coaching. Needs-based advice will be offered on topics ranging from technology to legal support, innovation, methodologies, peer-to-peer -peer networking. They will support us to organ supported organizations will be encouraged to engage with each other, share experience, learn from each other, explore partnerships. There's your peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, there's your edges, there's your branching dendritic patterns. This is this is this 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 we, we need to be thinking in these terms as we look at this uh, way forward for us. Other support based, other support based on project needs. This would include organizational support, help with project sustainability and scale, training on specific topics, etc. Media and communications. So the UNHCR could offer help under those five targets if we had a vision that met their needs and met their goals. And <clears throat> we also want to create a, a, an idea that meets our needs and meets our goals. And we're interested in the overlap between those two ecosystems. That's what we would have to create. So the approach we're told is to achieve its objectives, the fund has adopted the following approach to support forcibly displaced people to identify challenges and opportunities and develop solutions that can have lasting impact within their communities. These are exactly what Andre and January and, and, and various people have been saying to us. Provide a holistic support mechanism tailored to their requests, including financial support, mentorship, technical expertise across the innovation life cycle. Uh, connect disjointed, localized innovation by facilitating peer support, learning and sharing. Build evidence that proves the power of initiatives developed by forcibly displaced people and use this to overcome barriers that prevent them from accessing resources. Okay, those are all quite big words, but let's think about the changes that we've been able to help people make through permaculture education, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and then feedback mechanisms that has let us collect and analyze the experience of doing that. Um, so, if were we to, I looked at the, notes of this and um, were we to want to apply to this as a group, we would have to be able to answer all of these questions. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to be a formally registered organisation to apply. Um, they want a refugee-led partnership, but 
Um, but they especially like partnerships. So when I started, I when I looked, when, I don't want to be my idea, but what we have is Sector Thirty Nine as a training organisation with experience in peer to peer learning. We have demonstration and learning hubs uh, built around many of our members, with Deborah, Simon, uh, 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 and, and also people like Carolyn that are doing work in refugee settlements and connecting there. We have um, you know many many different examples. We have the Pomo Africa Center in. Kenya is part of our network. There is the Butambala Learning Center, part of our network. There's the guy, there's, there's the Rwandans. <clears throat> and then by linking with the local groups accreted from courses, TAPA and, and, and so forth, um, we've got quite a, 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 an association of groups that could come together with, if, with uh, Andre's commitment to start something in Kakuma or with the the, 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 the various momentums that are there in, in Nachivali, is there a coalition of interests that could come together? So <clears throat> could we, and wouldn't it be interesting to imagine what that group might look like and who might be members of it? And what would we call it? What would we call it? What would be our name? Um, we'd need a contact person, someone who would be the front of house. Um, indicate the title of your organization's contact person. Please indicate your email address, phone number, all of this stuff. Okay, if applicable, what's your thing? What level of organization could we interest? Are we, would we be interested in local, national, regional? In what country do we operate the most? This is all fairly straightforward in terms of leadership. If I was a brief description of the objectives and activities of your organization. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and this would be, I guess, the visualization of building a support network that connects together pioneers within the refugee co community with demonstration and learning hubs that those pioneering people could learn from, connect to, have the opportunity to visit, um, build nurseries, exchange plants and seeds, I don't know. A brief description of, of your organization and then different sectors, water and sanitation, health, education, livelihoods, child protection, gender based violence, environment and energy. Um, how long would it go on for? The country where you're planning to implement your project, would we just be in one country? Please describe the challenge or problem you are trying to address with your project or solution. Describe it in simple words as you would to a friend. So we'd have to come up with answers to these questions and to, to, to trim the words down and get it, get it kind of clever. Um, please describe your idea solution to the problem identified above. So we have to be very clearly Identify the problem we're addressing. How do we know it's a problem? Um, how are we addressing it? How is our idea or solution innovative? If we were successful, who would it be useful for? What's your budget? Do you plan to partner or collaborate with other organizations or entities to implement your project? Yes. Um, how did you find out about this fund? Would we share our name with other people? And a question about data protection. So this is an initial interest form, not too scary to fill in. 
Um, there's no. Thanks for calling video. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so I thought um, that for, to for, make ourselves think about something very focused um, that might come out of this work that we're doing together. And there's to say that there's a meeting planned for Friday for between um, Griffin, Matthew from Griffin, and the people who are um, African partners who were interested in contributing to their project. So they also thought that they would look at this form and see whether there was a fund that we could apply for. So it might be that it would be very wise for us to partner with Griffin as well as see that as part of our partnership and to look at specifically what we're doing it, it, it to, I don't, again, I don't know, but the the whole thing with the refractometer, with measuring BRICS values, is it gives you data that you can then actually have a measurement of not just you've improved the availability of food, but also the quality of the nutrition, the quality of the soil, and then we can infer from that the longer, wider environmental benefit. So I, I in, in my mind, all of these elements kind of come together. We're at Education and Training Network. We've set up demonstration hubs and sites. We've built a network of pioneer teachers and community kind of leaders. Those people are learning very useful skills. Um, and we're, we're learning how to maintain a dialogue with those people and to remain kind of connected. And, um, and in the process of doing that, we're coming into contact with lots of refugee people and we are beginning to see the value and in those people and the potential enormous contribution that they could make firstly in their own communities but maybe as kind of climate leaders because there is going to be people from within those refugee populations that are kind of leading the way for the rest of the world and I think that's my, that's the vision. And I looked at that somehow what I started to see um, in that. And I saw that perhaps that vision might be something that is unifying. Um, maybe. Uh, What do you think, guys? Um, and 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 um, can we use this model as a visionary tool to ask ourselves? Can we see ourselves as a, a, a unifying with a common goal, and that? Can we come together around permaculture ethics and values? Can we say, you know, the, the, the process, our proposal is we have a, a group of people who are coming together through experience, working, studying, sharing together um, uh, to create a common kind of vision based on values. And, and from that come our long-term goal, which is to spread the benefit of permaculture far and wide into the world um, uh, in a way in which it can grow very quickly, it can have a life of its own. We don't want to own it or control it, we want to set it in motion. If we had some funds and resources as a group, we could then think about how we might use those. But to do that, the next thing we'd think about would be, well, what are our strategies? What, what's the actual plan to achieve these long-term goals? Okay, we want to get permaculture out there. We need a strategy for 
managing the education function, managing the feedback function. Uh, 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 we're going to need to have a strong uh, learner network or teacher support network. So we need to build strategies around those things. We need to have an interface into our um, target areas, including uh, refugee settlements. <clears throat> so if those are our strategies, we're going to break those down into then what are the activities, what are the building blocks that will build our training network or build our uh, learner support network, the things that we've identified here. And can we arrange those activities onto a, side of, uh, onto a timeline? Which ones, you know, which, which order would we do them? Uh, what would be our priority, uh, et cetera? And, um, and then when we've thought about the goals, the strategies, the broken those into activities, we can then look at the resource pot, in this case, $45,000, and think, how would we uh, allocate that to each one of the activities and we break those down and create a little budget for each one. We've got to have bioregional organizational chart. We've got our sort of consensus model here that we're looking at. I, I'm sort of feeling like these are tools that we could use to visualize how our network might go forward and also how we might create a common vision and and then have a very clear ask. These are the resources that we need, and we know what the resources we need because we've answered every step of that journey that breaks that down. If someone just said to us, hey, here's $45,000, we'd all start arguing about, well, I want lamps and I want some, and ooh, I deserve it more than you. And next thing you know, we have uh, mayhem. So we have to do it the other way around. And we have to start by standing on the firm ground of that common value, that common commitment that, 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 that we, you know, and ask ourselves, do we have that? Is that there? Because if it isn't there, we can't build the network. We, we're not going to be strong enough. It, it's, we've got to be unwavering in, in our kind of foundation stone. Um, yes, okay. So it's a shame we have, we've, um, obviously we're recording this and, Caroline will probably catch us later. Um, I'm going to just, oh yeah, there we go. Stop share for a moment. Um, oh yeah, uh, sorry, okay. uh, Caroline is there. Sorry, I just couldn't see. Okay, cool, great. Um, any thoughts on what I all just said? And, and, and Gerald, if you could help summarize, maybe make sure I've come across understandably and, and just to hear a few thoughts. Yes, Steve. Um, by the way, sorry about the noise feedback. I'm using a different machine and it's proving to be chaotic. So apologies for the feedback and the mics sometimes being erratic. Um, I think it's all brilliant. We couldn't say it any further. And uh, yes, we, we can work around different options or uh, create lots of uh, synchronicity, like different synergies, support the teams. And uh, it would be really interesting to support uh, some of our teams to, to take on that application. Because uh, when I quickly read through it or when I quickly ran through it, they are encouraging uh, indigenous or refugee-led organizations to take the lead. So uh, basically our presence or as sector 39, we would basically be give you a supportive role or be in the background. It's good to mention it that yes, we are collaborating, we're working together, we can uh, then share from a capacity building point of view, but then, and uh, maybe also give 
sort of a recommendation that we are aware of your potentials, but then you have the mantle at the forefront. And I think uh, that's one of the first checkpoints they want to use to see that indeed is uh, a refugee red kind of uh, initiative. And it's, it's interesting that they are also slightly flexible with the nature of the registration. At some point, they are also accepting groups as long as it's formally registered. So that's the beauty with it. It would be good to guide you or to organize a session to, to probably run through it uh, with, as a team or to, to run through some of those bits and pieces. It's good that we have the different aspects. Steve, very technical. Stella is good with uh, uh, project monitoring and evaluation. And maybe I can give a hand on the bit to do with uh, budgeting and financing. So we can really create that sort of synergy. And, and uh, also, if I'm to say it really fits into our objective as uh, Sector 39 Academy, because we are looking at how do we build grassroots momentum? How do we build capacity for people to be their own leaders, to take it on? All right. Um, over to you, Steve. Unless we have anyone with a question or a contribution. <clears throat> yeah, I'm very keen to hear just people's thoughts. But one of the things I've wrestled with is on a PDC, we really ought to, we need to come together to work on a design and to have something that we've contributed towards using the ideas and the principles that we've been learning about on the PDC. And I think as much as we, you're doing your own work in your own place and really excited to see people's photos coming in on WhatsApp and, and, and we'll comment on them and we wanna see what you're doing, but let's maybe use this process as a collaboration to be a design that we've created working together. And to think about how um, as a network of, because the target beneficiaries are refugee community people, displaced people. And we, we talked a lot already about how we can see how important that is to create learning, to support those people. So who are the best teachers? It's people like Deborah, it's people like Caroline, Simon, and people who are within that permaculture community in the host nation. You've now got skills and knowledge and insights, which can then feed into the learning of those people in the settlements and help connect them perhaps to Uganda a new country for, for some people. And then you have the support and the networking of Sector 39 Academy to connect you to other, other places and other people and for us to somehow share that learning. And so I see a, a, an interesting partnership, a cooperative partnership of some kind, um, where we each come together as our own selves, our own organizations, but we contribute to this greater whole, which is to create a project that's defined and led by, the end of the day, the, the long-term beneficiaries being the displaced people. And we might learn in that process how to, help, teach, facilitate, contribute, maybe help propagate plants, develop seed savings, and all sorts of other micro enterprises that might fit into that. Because this isn't something that's going to go away, it's going to be ongoing, and it's going to be flushes of displaced people, and that's what's, you know, that's, that's how it's gonna be. So um, there's a whole ecosystem to be explored, how we can work uh, you know, usefully and creatively 
in that environment. That, that's, yeah. Think about how we could, each of us, in the same way as a football team, we've got very different roles. The goalkeeper, the striker, the guy does the kit, the person who makes the sandwiches, will contribute in different ways. That's my thought. Um, and, and anything else from the group? Thank you, Simon. Yes. Yes. Now, perhaps the, the the form that you have just displayed on the screen, I, as a, a person of permaculture, I really need us to go in for that because it will give us a very good grip on the background, whereby we will be known by even those internally displaced people uh, and it will really give us a great value to to to, to the communities so uh, we really need to see how we can drop in our application for that form and then you as the principal uh, would be would be the one to back on what Oh, you would be the one to back of on behalf on behalf of those groups, and then we see how basically skills can be delivered to those people, and then we will be in position to go in for that application. I think it is good for us to go in for that application. No problem there. Work would be there. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the for for that. And thank you for the support. I I think I mean nothing ventured, nothing gained. There's no real downside. We want to. I want to try and use it as a tool to get us to think about how we might collaborate better, and that helps us develop our academy idea, and it helps support you as permaculture learners and teachers and conveyors of that information. So it makes makes sense to me. And yet we can very much um, hold that space. I think that's what Sector 39 can do and help bring together these constituent parts because I think we've all got, yeah, something to, to offer. And a question might be, is, is that the academy, us coming together, or are we creating a new organism that is our collaboration that there's our thoughts there's a thought but it's some kind of a, a collaborative permaculture framework that we can then invite people to be part of um including ourselves but then also you know the people that are refugee partners as well i know so let's visit from the kitten yes Steve. yeah Actually, I think this brings in uh, another conversation which would be interesting. How about doing the collaborative kind of learning or the kind of uh, project that we were thinking about where we're going to get the learnings from Northern Uganda, uh, Maji, uh, Maji and BDBD, and then transpose the same to Nachivari and Kakuma. But then now at this point, we, we go in as the academy, but with the forefront of uh, our brothers or the beneficiaries who are in those actual settlements. So in other words, who get the best practicing uh, people, people like Abale from, uh, from Maji or from BDBD to go down to Nachivari to train others using their learning and also lessons learned from the trainings we've done previously. So they are still at the forefront we are at the back end of it, 
but they are taking on the mantle themselves. That, that's actually a very good point is to draw obviously on the, 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 so the people from 2018 and show that continuity. Um, because otherwise, yeah, why are we proposing this? Is, is, um, but that, that can connect right through. Um, and that's what inspired us to create the, so in, in, in 2018, um, we did the six month training in, in, in West Nile with the refugees. Um, and in 2019, we, we didn't know what to do next. And in 2019, Gerald came to the UK and he stayed with me for three months and we spent some time having this kind of conversation. And, and that was when we wrote the bid for the Academy of Permaculture. And, um, and that was from a period from the 1st of January, 2020 until now. And, and that's what I was trying to explain this in my message to you, Deborah, but that's what has got us this far. We did the, um, the, the, the Happy Home Kumi PDC. We've done the, um, the Rwanda PDC. We've done a lot of work with, in Perma, with, Trey, with uh, Kenya and with Paul. And, and also Ali's Butambala has come from that. Through the first PDC came Tapa and then all your local groups in Teso. So, um, and then that's when the money's run out and we're left going, ah, oh, so <clears throat> that, Ella, Ella, come here, come here. Oh, come on, Ella. I'm getting harassed by this little thing. There we go. So, um, Yes, that's how we got here. So it's from that, that thinking and planning that we did three years ago, that's then created this chain of events, which has now brought us to doing this PDC now, and our collaboration with Matthew and with Griffin. And so th these feel like the jigsaw pieces for the next phase of what we're doing. And, and, um, and uh, I don't know if Stella wants to contribute to a little bit as well, because Stella met with Matthew yesterday, was it yesterday? We had a little meeting on um, the other day and um, talked a bit about this BRICS testing. And I, I think that that's an element in our design as well. It's the data collection and, and evidence part of it. Um, yes. Stella, any thoughts from you? I don't know if you're able to contribute from where you're at, but um, your impressions from Matthew and the Griffin thing. No, I'm just seeing uh, Shanaz's comment as well. Thank you, Shanaz. She's saying there's a strong permaculture network here in Kent, and our community garden here is now being run according to permaculture principles. The bed size has been reduced, um, or since I saw it, and up seven miles up the road, there's another permaculture hub. Um, yes, yeah, there was a local refugee group which has now disbanded, supporting people in, in, in Kenya. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Shanaz. She's just um, popped off. So thank you for that contribution. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's about connecting with what's, what's going around us and then using that to build our sort of wider network, I guess. Stella, any thoughts from you? Just uh, if you're able to. Don't worry if not. Whatever it is that we do, it's got to work for all of us in our own situation and not just be some crazy thing that we're only doing because there's a chance of getting some money out of it. That's always the wrong way to do it. So again, that's why I showed the model about think about the ethics, think about our long-term goals, and then think about how we break that down into individual strategies and contributions. And so then there'd be a very clear role for certain people to, you know, to fulfill those functions that we've identified. We've lost, we lost Stella, so yeah. 
So that's what I've got to say on that, really. Um, okay, if we've got no, I've I've kind of said what I came to say. So and and I don't know. It's it's quite hard to work through perhaps that format with some of those questions. But I think that's going to be the the homework for the week. And it's use the WhatsApp group. And so if we haven't joined everyone on Twitter, I'm just still getting better at doing that as well. Um, um, and let's try and then think about this partnership. Who would be who would who who would we invite in our cluster? And and begin to think about what the objectives of the group would be and what problem it is that we're addressing. There's some very specific questions on that form. So that, that's where we would be going. And 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 Firstly, we could treat it as an academic learning exercise, but we're also going to really submit this bid in a real way, and we're going to use it as a tool to build our partnership, to expand our edges, to connect with the Griffin Network and their connections. And they've just done a big piece of research in India with a whole bunch of farmers in Andhra Pradesh. So will benefit a lot by making these connections and reaching out in this way. And uh, we're going to tap into the knowledge and experience of what we've had from before. And we're going to use that to inform us of, of, of how we're going to go forward. So um, um, there we go. There's, 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 there's edges and the marginal that I've given you some general patterns. I've given you the drawings and diagrams, the, the concepts, but then I've also asked you to really think about the own edges and boundaries and interfaces and connections around you. I've asked you to think about people networks, information networks, and, and think about how we can take all of these understandings into how we build a wider um two-way support network between us but one that also can learn through feedback so we need to click, find clever ways in which we can people can share their experiences of doing permaculture in their circumstances oh yeah okay um anyone got anything else i'd like to contribute or question to ask A little bit early this week, but I, I, I think we've kind of covered it. So um, let's keep thinking along those lines. Um, thank everyone for your attention and your contributions this week. They're really, really valuable. And um, I'm going to be asking us all to think more specifically about these questions that we've asked and think about how we develop our training network up to the next level. And if we can win resources, let's think about how we can use that to really strengthen and reinforce the network so that it can grow and develop. And, um, and uh, Gerald and myself and Stella will hold that space. We're looking to you for your contributions, for your ideas and your thoughts. Um, what we're also learning and I could direct this point to you, Deborah, but it could be true for everyone. And it's true for uh, it, there'll be whatever it is that's going on with people we trained in 2018. <clears throat> is, what I'm learning is we need to keep investing into the groups to make them feel connected and to share information so that people understand where we're at and the decisions that we're making. And it's, it's very easy especially with poor, with limited communications, for some people to feel left out is, oh, I haven't got a phone, or I haven't got the data to access the lesson. I feel excluded, or, or whatever that might be happening, is we, we've got to be really aware of that. So we've got to keep communicating back to our groups to make sure that people understand where we're at and they still feel, you know, they haven't been forgotten or, or dropped off. And, and, and what I'm aware of is there's quite a lot of people that reach out to me 
social media and WhatsApp and what have you. And we have a, a short exchange. Hello, I'm in Cameroon. Hello, I'm in Malawi. We need to do something here. And I don't quite know how to, to, to carry that on, but it's clear that there's people out there looking for that. And I think that through our training network, we're going to increasingly be able to involve those people in remote learning, starting their own hubs and, and local groups. And we're all going to be able to contribute to that going forward so that we can help spread the knowledge and involvement of permaculture and far and wide as quickly as it needs to grow. Okay, that's my <clears throat> closing thought for the week. So I'm going to say thank you very much, everybody. And um, let's leave a space for anyone who wants to say good evening. Uh, otherwise, we shall see you all next week for lesson 22. And I'll be putting notes on the WhatsApp chat specifically questions and do give me feedback and if you don't like this idea tell me well. but i think that it's well worth our attention thanks okay. bye-bye <laughs> bye-bye everybody bye-bye nice bye -bye. Bye -bye. everyone good night caroline Bye bye. Ah, Jagwe, Akwara na Jokan. Ah, Edia Jok. Let's play, everyone. Did a good session. Okay.